Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 24, The Screwtape Letters, Letter Number 13, Cup of Brown Joy. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where David, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we are eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient a human assigned to be tempted by Screwtape's nephew, Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. But today, I am not joined by Andrew, and I am not joined by David, but it is another guest co-host. And the guest co-host today is an individual who appeared on an After Hours episode last season, the father, Brian McGreevy. And so if you want to go check that out before I do an introduction here, it was season three, episode 35, and it was fantastic. I just re-listened to it for a second time right before this. But Father Brian is assistant to the rector for hospitality ministry at the historic St. Philip's Church in Charleston, South Carolina, which was founded in 1680. He is married to his wife, Jane, and they have four children. He began by studying law at Emory University and worked at an international finance and insurance trade association for over 15 years, becoming the Managing Director International. He and his wife later went on to run a bed and breakfast, and subsequently he felt a call to join the priesthood in the Anglican Church. He has recorded several podcasts about C.S. Lewis, and currently he is teaching through the book we discussed in Season 1, Mere Christianity. Father Brian, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you so much, Matt. It's great to be here with you and excited to talk about this great letter. Well, I am particularly excited because when I was re-listening to your After Hours interview with David in preparation for this, he talked to you so much about the screw tape letters, or he asked you to talk to the people about the screw tape letters. And so much of what you talked about applies so specifically to this letter. And I remember you made this one comment. You said, screw tape is a tr- is trying to tempt the patient away, not tempt the patient towards, which that statement alone not only unlocks so much of the screw tape letters, but will be particularly applicable today. And then I also loved that mere Christianity was so influential in your reconversion story to the faith. When I heard that, that was that was actually the book myself that brought me back to Christianity. For me, it was the beauty of living a Christian life in that book that played such a big role in me, not quite knowing if Christianity was true, but at least I wanted to give it a shot. And then after hours, you spoke so much about pleasure and beauty pointing towards the truth of the gospel. So I could very much relate to your reconversion as well. Well, I think it is an amazing thing that mere Christianity has been involved in so many people's conversion and reconversion. And I think that that whole thing that we were talking about in the after hours about uh, the tempting away from rather than the tempting to is something that's so important in our culture today. And I think this particular letter does a great job of hitting at that. And just the way you speak of, uh, and you did in the after hours, we're going to say this today too, the habits and feelings. That has been probably the second biggest theme behind what you just said, tempting away and tempting to that I have seen in the screw tape letters. And it's been so helpful in my own personal journey of in this COVID environment where so many of our habits are honestly being attacked right now because our routines have been destroyed. Uh, the, the things that we have built up in our spiritual life from spiritual practice to going to certain church services, uh, for myself in the Catholic nomination, going to Eucharist adoration, all of these things just stopped and it's been so hard. So this book has been so applicable. So I'm excited just to be able to hear you speak to habits and feelings a bit today as well as it might pop up as we're having a conversation on this letter. Sounds great. I'm sure it will. Excellent. And then for the quote of the week, I like this one. This one comes from letter 13, the one we're doing here today. You should always try to make the patient abandon the people or food or books he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food in the important books. Listeners, you will see when we get on that, that is going to be 
very powerful today. And for the drink of the week, I am drinking That Boutique Whiskey Company. It's a six-year age single malt. So what I did is I bought an advent calendar that was a single drink and taste of 24 different scotches. So I am slowly working through those. Uh, Father Brian, do you have any sort of drink, whether tea, water, uh, beverage with you? I do. I have a delicious, spicy Fentiman's British ginger beer that is quite delicious and refreshing. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So, listeners, this uh, boutique six year, I've never had a six year, but just to give you a quick tasting notes as we always do, this is quite yellow. Usually we have 12 year, 14 year, 16 year. So it's very clear as yellow. It's very fruity and it has a toffee flavor to it. So surprisingly, for six year, I'm, it's a little bit harsh, but I would definitely say it's okay. And it definitely has some good length. And so for our toast, this one is going to go out to Brittany, who is in our Slack community. And Brittany, we raise a class to you today because we can't thank you enough for all your help and support this past year in the ministry. We raise a glass to the cloud of grace coming around you in your times of need, which we will get into shortly. And finally, the chapter summary before diving in. Wormwood is in trouble. The patient seems to have had a renewal in his faith, resulting in a spiritual asphyxiating cloud which has protected him from Wormwood's attack. Wormwood's crucial mistake was to allow the patient some real pleasures. A nice walk alone in beautiful surroundings, a cup of tea, and an enjoyable book. Screwtape says that these provided a touchstone of reality. Hell wants the man to never enjoy things for themselves but only because the world tells him they are fashionable. Screw tape closes by emphasizing that it is paramount that the patient not act upon this recent conversion. And so, listeners, before diving into the letter, a reminder in the last letter, these have been progressing in a very cool fashion. In the last letter, David and I talked about how there was a slow and steady path away from the light towards nothing. And Screwtape had him in this perfect balance, as we talked about, between this sense of uneasiness that did create a guilt and a shame that did push him away from the enemy, but it wasn't enough to cause repentance. But as we're going to see in this letter, the situation has changed drastically, and that balance of uneasiness must have gotten away from Wormwood. And so let me read what the very first paragraph starts with. Here's Screwtape coming out with a bang. The long and short of it is that you have let the man slip through your fingers. The situation is very grave, and I really see no reason why I should try to shield you from the consequences of your inefficiency. A repentance and a renewal, what the other side call grace, on the scale which you describe is a defeat of the first order. It amounts to a second conversion, and probably on a deeper level than the first. <laughs> wow, Father Brian, that is quite the uh, the start there. Yes, it's pretty much a scathing response that Wormwood has really blown it. And it goes right back to what you were just talking about in that last letter, that vague sense of uneasiness, which is what they wanted to encourage. And Wormwood has let that get out of hand and turn into a full-blown repentance. And the thing that is so interesting about that is it seems like that uh, Screwtape and his forces have had great luck in the English language since this happened, because I think a lot of people now repent, just that means to them be sorry. Mm -hmm. And repent is actually a very active word that literally means about face to turn around. It implies action as part of the meaning of the word. And so what we have here is a full blown scriptural repentance um, that amounts to a complete turning around and reconversion. So, of course, screw tape is furious about it. And what do you think he means at the very end there when he says, on a deeper level than the first? Like, what is it about this reconversion? I was thinking about this as I was prepping that makes this even more powerful, potentially, he says probably, than the first one. Yeah, I think that part of what that is is uh, where Jesus talks about uh, he who has been forgiven much, loves much, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the one who's forgiven a little loves a little. And I think the farther you go in your spiritual walk with Jesus and you um, become more and more aware of your frailties and your sinfulness, and then you repent and come back, your sense of love and devotion and commitment is that much stronger as a result. That is a beautiful way of putting it. And I always think of from an analogy, David and I talk about this. I'm single, so I'm not married, but he himself being married, you have when you when you first meet your wife, you're in that honeymoon stage and falling in love and then you get married and that's still going on. But then slowly the honeymoon phase kind of comes down and there's there's almost like a reconversion of love, like a deeper love once you both get set in your ways and you, you realize your weaknesses and you're living together and yet she still loves you and you're still loving her. And I always, I always somewhat picture it something like that as well. There's a, a deeper type of love. You are dying to the old love and being reborn into like a newer love. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. And I think that the strength of the commitment, every time you go through this kind of thing, the commitment becomes stronger and that makes it more beautiful. Yes. Now, if any listeners are like me, and have been felt like they're more at letter 12, or even maybe they're in the trough period from, I believe it was like letter eight or nine. What happened to get the patient out? So what we see here is the patient realized it and went through a deep repentance and renewal, as as you just mentioned, Father Brian, and that caused the enemy to come in a strong way. And it talks about this cloud. So let me read here what Screwtape writes. Is you ought to have known the asphyxiating cloud, which prevented your attacking the patient on his walk back from the old mill is a well-known phenomenon. It is the enemy's most barbarous weapon and generally appears when he is directly present to the patient under certain modes, not yet fully classified. Some humans are permanently surrounded by it and therefore inaccessible to us. Why do you make this asphyxiating cloud? I just love this image because I think that it speaks so profoundly into what it really means to live the Christian life, not just a shallow sort of intellectual commitment, but really to be in relationship with God. And uh, this whole part about the enemy being sensibly directly present uh, is just a beautiful thing that I think that for many Christians, we can think of times where we have been very aware of God's presence being directly with us. And this is a concept that Lewis plays with in several other spots. Um, Letter 22, which y'all haven't gotten to yet, so I won't spill all the beans (laughs) on that. Spoiler alert. Right, exactly. It has a great part about the asphyxiating cloud surrounding a whole house and family that the patient's gotten involved with. And there the implication is because there's a whole group of people who are deeply committed to following Jesus and that they are praying and they are in deep fellowship with each other, that it becomes impenetrable. And this whole idea of prayer um, making this impenetrable um, also gets picked up a little bit in uh, the novel That Hideous Strength uh, around St. Anne's house. There's an, uh, they, they have the nice in that book, and, and I won't spoil that book either, but uh, the people <laughs> Let's spoil the them forces, all. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are the forces of evil in that book um, have trouble uh, getting through because there there's kind of a barrier that they don't understand. And it reminds me so much of that great verse in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God. And that, of course, is where St. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he goes through and talks about what that is. And he says it is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the readiness given by the gospel of peace, taking up the shield of faith taking the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication and then keeping alert. And you, know, you think about all of those things. Um, if, if a Christian is practicing all of those things, especially in community, it makes it very hard for Satan, for Screwtape, for Wormwood to get a toehold. 
And I think it's particularly appropriate during Advent because I love the way that verse ends with the keep alert with all perseverance, which is what Mm -hmm. uh, the theme of Advent is about staying awake, not being asleep, being the watchman. Do you think it has any relation to, I'm curious, your thoughts from your theological training? Uh, It brought me also to Hebrews 12, 1, where it talks about surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. I kind of pictured that is the word I'm thinking of when you were talking about repentance, metanoia, when you turn away from, Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. so when it says here, throw off everything that hinders in the sin, I almost think of that deep repentance and then this cloud of witness coming in. Do you think there's anything with that as well? Absolutely. I think that is absolutely part of that because one of the things that we miss out on, I think, uh, in our modern day American Christianity is we don't understand how profoundly together the New Testament church was, that they were together literally physically all the time. And they were very connected with this idea that we have come to call the communion of the saints. And so this whole idea of the church triumphant, the believers who are now with Jesus in heaven, um, that image that uh, the writer of the Hebrew uses there really is like a stadium that has fans cheering on the athletes. And so I think that is absolutely part of it. And when that's going on, it makes it that much harder for Satan to be heard. Just a little side note uh, for listeners. I don't talk about this too much, but I did a two-week trip to Israel uh, with this individual named Ray Vanderlaan, and he was teaching a lesson on this exact verse, and we were in this stadium, and he talked about this cloud of witnesses and run the race. And so he had like 40 of us high school students, this was right before college, just sprinting around the track as if we were running the race with our full effort, and these cloud of witnesses were cheering us on. And so every time I think of this, or I read this, I think of that image. And I think there is a beauty to that of just picturing these people cheering you on in in that grace that comes with that. Yes, absolutely. And I think it also just speaks to the power of encouragement that you see Mm -hmm. just right before that in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, where we're enjoined that we need to encourage each other daily. And we live in such a time of tearing people down, tearing down institutions, tearing down faith, all of that, that encouragement is really a radical act. Yes. Yes. I always, I always love to point out when people, you meet certain people and they're very edifying. They like speak words of truth, speak words of life into you. And those people are just such a gift whenever you have them, friends, colleagues, people you meet, even some one-off people, you walk away and it's like, wow, I just felt like I got edified somehow. Yeah. And then I ask myself, how do I do that? <laughs> Still waiting for that answer. <laughs> right. That's always the hard question. That's a good question to ask. <laughs> yes. Well, now let's turn to some of Wormwood's blunders. We're going to see what happened. How did he let the patient get to this point? And as we always try to do, we're going to do this because we want to tease out what we can learn from this because I would venture every one of us listening to this, no matter what position we're at, wants this cloud to come around us and wants to experience that defense. And so it begins with true pleasure. So here's what Screwtape writes. On your own showing, you first of all allowed the patient to read a book he really enjoyed because he enjoyed it and not in order to make clever remarks about it to his new friends. I mean, that's just... First of all, that seems like a foreign concept to me, to enjoy a book for the sake of just enjoying it. So often I find myself reading theological books, thinking about Pines with Jack, um, or reading f- philosophy books or business books, thinking about my work. And how often do you just sit down and enjoy a book for the sake of enjoying it or not to sound smart? <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. And I think that is part of the disease of living in a really utilitarian age um, and the, the, sort of what's happened to education that we we th- we always think about a means to an end of productivity instead of just the the beauty and the joy that can be inherent in reading something that's really good. And that's one of the things I love about Lewis is Lewis was such an unabashedly enthusiastic reader. And there's one, you know, and the funny thing is he's reading in multiple languages. And there, there was a part in that uh, 
series, um, which is called The Question of God, that you may have seen that Armand Nikolai did, the Harvard professor. Uh, but they quote Lewis when he was uh, reading in Greek uh, something of Euripides, the Hippolytus of Euripides, and he's caught up into these great visions of beauty and glory. And I just think to myself every time I hear that, who does that happen to anymore today, <laughs> let alone who could be reading for pleasure in Greek? Yep. I remember, this is kind of a weird thing to come to me, but <laughs> I remember when I was in middle school, I would watch people who were painting or drawing and you could see them completely engulfed in what they were doing and or engrossed and they were just, they were drawn in fully. And for some reason, it drew me in, like th seeing them do something for the joy and the pleasure of it honestly like brought warm feelings to me. There was something about that. I don't know what it was. Sure. And I think, I think this whole idea of pleasure we're going to get more into as we walk through this letter. But I think here, uh, Lewis is very intentional about the types of pleasures that he describes and so first you see that he's in a place that is beautiful. It's a place that there's sort of an implication that it may have memories for him. Um, there is beauty there. Um, he has a cup of tea there. He reads the book, and it reminds me about how important it is that we embrace real pleasures that focus our hearts on beauty and truth and goodness. And it's just uh, such a great illustration of uh, Philippians 4, 8, the whole finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And uh, this is just a great, uh, beautiful example of someone choosing to do exactly that and the result of it. And he's not trying to go have some big spiritual experience. He sets out just to do these things, um, but he is deliberate in setting out to do them. He brings the book, he orders the tea, and then God does the rest. And that's mm -hmm. what's so beautiful about it. This makes me think of uh, in Thomas Aquinas uh, in his Summa Theologia in question 38, he actually talks about remedies for despair and we could somewhat think of the patient in that when he was in the trough period, a few letters before this, and kind of this slow fade was probably feeling it. And I do find it interesting how he points out one thing to combat that is experiencing true pleasures. So he mentions sleep, taking a bath, quality time with a friend, uh, having a glass of wine. Like some of these remedies for despair uh, are, are pleasures, but I think what's important is, as you mentioned now, they've got to be these true pleasures that are pointing towards truth, beauty, and goodness. Because today I feel like pleasures gets a bad rap. When people talk about pleasures, it's usually referring to the pleasures to the wrong degree in the w wrong way. And that's how it's got that connotation rather than a good pleasure versus the bad pleasure. I think that's ag absolutely right. And you know, part of it is I think that we have this whole idea – that Satan is the one who's the source of things that are pleasures and that mm -hmm. um, God's pleasures are, if anything, if God has any pleasures, then they must be boring. And uh, <laughs> that is, you know, again, a triumph of the philology department uh, of Screwtape and his minions, because God is the source of all pleasure. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's just something that we we miss out on. And there's a great section in letter 22 about that, uh, again, with that whole idea that, and I don't want to skip ahead too much here, but right after that is when Screwtape talks about um, that the characteristics of pain and pleasures is that they're unmistakably real. And yes. therefore, like, uh, give the man who feels them a touchstone of reality. And there's a uh, letter 22, again, not too much of a spoiler here because this is sort of a little bit of an aside and the main point of the letter, which I still haven't given away. Uh, <laughs> Screwtape rails about God and pleasure. And I, I just love this section. And what he says is 
God, the enemy, that is. He's a hedonist at heart. All those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only a facade or only like foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out in his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ugh! I don't think he has the least inkling of that high and austere mystery to which we rise in the miserific vision. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He has a bourgeois mind. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day long without his minding in the least. Sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, praying, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's any use to us. We fight under cruel disadvantages. It's wow. almost enough to make you feel sorry for him. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> oh, that makes me think of uh, – Lewis actually helped me with this in, in a little bit G.K. Chesterton did, but some of mere Christianity. The idea that Christian teaching – Christian theology, some of the do's, the don'ts, the rights, the wrongs that so much get the bad rap as, as we're talking about the fasts, they're meant to allow us to experience the fullness of joy. And they're not meant to, David once said in a recording that we did, we don't have a God upstairs that sees us having fun and says, thou shalt not. And that's just not how he works. And what the reason for helping us to understand where the boundaries are with certain types of desires of our is so we don't take them too far. So we don't do them in the wrong way to the wrong degree. And when we don't, we actually experience such joy and beauty. I did this uh, Exodus 90. It was like this 90-day type of fast from media, technology, drinking, snacking, certain things. And none of these things in their own right are bad. But the point is a lot of times these things end up controlling us and we don't actually have true freedom. And it was amazing when I finished that after 90 days. And one time I did it successfully, another time I miserably failed. <laughs> uh, my addiction <laughs> levels were much higher. But the time I did it successfully, when you start, you're afraid to let go of these things. And then it was amazing, the pleasures I did. Because I came home and I'm like, well, I can't watch a movie. I can't watch TV. Well, you know what? Let me go call up a friend and talk with him for an hour and a half. Or let me go for a run or a walk. And it forces you when you don't have these cheap pleasures to experience the real ones. And it's it's as somewhat you described here from letter 22, it's amazing the joy and the peace that you feel from that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, he's channeling Aquinas a little bit here uh, with the sleeping, washing part. And, you know, that part of the reason I think Lewis loves that is that Lewis was always fighting against modern day Gnosticism mm -hmm. and trying to remind people that God is a God of matter, that God is a God of the physical, and that he made humans with bodies on purpose, and that the, those types of pleasures are what it, it's part and parcel of what it means to be human and to fully live into that humanity. Mm. Now we got to look at what was it about the book and the walk that was dangerous in relation to this last letter. And so here is what Screwtape writes. He says that it would peel off from his sensibility the kind of crust you have been forming on it and make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself. As a prim preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you wanted to detach him from himself, and he made some progress in doing so. Now all that is undone. So listeners, if you remember last week when we were doing letter 12, we talked about how it feels like the slow fade today when it was talking about how you can get the patient to essentially go through an entire day without doing anything that he enjoys. It really reminded me of this culture that we have today with social media technology of just the infinite scroll. And you can just spend your time getting sucked down these vortexes of TV shows and technology and media and not doing anything. And so what I get from what it's talking about here is... By allowing him to feel and be in, in with reality, as you just said, Father Brian, in touching reality, it takes off that work that they had of attempting to detach uh, the patient from reality and putting this crust on. But now it's getting peeled away by a true pleasure. Yeah. And I think that that is such a rich point. And Screwtape is going to go on in a moment to 
talk more about that detachment. But before mm-hmm. he gets to that part, I think just this whole idea about God wants to really make us ourselves and to free us from all of these tawdry things that we embrace. It's like that old quotation um, about we're like children messing around with mud pies in the slums because we can't imagine what is meant by a holiday at the seashore, which is one of yes. Lewis's great phrases. But I think that's so much it. And it's like what St. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Mm-hmm. And we have some of the wrong understanding of what freedom is. The classical definition of license is what most people now think freedom means. And it's that whole idea that freedom is unfettered ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want. But the funny thing is, particularly as I do counseling with folks, especially young adults, I'll ask a lot of them, when is the time that you felt, in, and these are people who are Christians, when is the time that you felt the strongest in your faith where you're experiencing joy? And very frequently, it is when they are in a camp kind of situation. And it's not necessarily because the music's great or the food's great or anything like that, but it's because they're in a schedule. They're in a schedule where they're getting up in the morning, they're eating on a regular basis, they have scripture time, they have worship time, they have ministry time. And in some ways you look at that and you think, well, that's not freedom. You have to be all these places at particular times. But the fact of the matter is the way that we're made is that when we adopt those kinds of priorities, we are more free to live into who God made us to be. That is a brilliant thing to bring up because I also spend a good bit of time just, it's my personality, but trying to optimize my my productivity, my work life, the personal, the professional, the spiritual, all of that. And I always tell people, because they're like, man, Matt, you're just like the creature of routine. Or I used to, I, I guess pre-COVID I was. <laughs> and I go, it, it makes me so much freer. When I have a very healthy diet for my normal breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I feel complete freedom to eat whatever I want if I'm going out to eat and I'm not afraid that this is going to control me or take over. Or when I have a healthy exercise routine, it allows me to actually be more free. And when I am very rigid with my work schedule, it actually allows me to be more spontaneous outside of those hours because I know and I can trust, I can be confident that this stuff's getting done. So there's almost a paradox that routine can make you more free and open you up in so many ways. Absolutely. I think that I think that's very true. And I think that's why spiritual disciplines are such a gift. Now, obviously they can be misused, yes. but if you are if you are adopting them for the right reasons um, and your heart is in the right place and you're not trying to serve the discipline, but you're trying to use the discipline as a means to grow closer in your walk with God, uh, it's an amazing thing. Ah, oh, that's such a good, uh, a good point to make there. Now, we're reading about this screw tape wanting to detach the patient from reality. Yeah, I would imagine some of our listeners and even myself as I'm first reading this, we're constantly told that we're in Christianity, there's a detachment that we're supposed to do as well. And so these seem to to contradict each other, but we're going to realize here very quickly that they aren't. The, the detachment that Christianity is talking about or the heavenly detachment is very different than the detachment that screw tape is talking about. And so we just talked about how screw tape is talking about a, de- a detachment from reality. And so let's see what screw tape writes here. Of course, I know that the enemy also wants to detach men from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes the little vermin. <laughs> I love that sentence. And, and sets an absurd value on the distinctness of every one of them. When he talks of their losing their selves, he only means abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts, I am afraid sincerely, that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. So we have this detachment from a self-will. That's what's interesting. And I, I thought about this. I'm curious what you think here, uh, Father Brian. I thought another way, because sometimes a detachment of self-will, I do believe there's it's it's clear and straightforward, but another way I've I somewhat thought of this was ego. 
um, self-will, ego. I think there's some relation there. And my ego, in a lot of ways, has been built up based on desires of the world. And we're going to talk about substitute desires in a sec, but it's it's the part of me that's been trained to act a certain way, to be a certain way, to believe certain things, to do certain things in order to win and earn the love of the approval of the world because we we want to be loved and we want to be admired. And when that goes astray, we're building up the ego to do that. And so I somewhat think of that detachment from that self-will as somewhat related to that. Yeah. And I think that you are not alone. I think that's the human condition. Uh to do that. And we construct sort of the straw man uh, that in some ways is a lot like the, the persona that we project on Instagram or whatever social media, um, the way that we want to be perceived, that is not, in fact, who we are. And so I think the the more that we can be inauthentic, we create a playground for Satan and his minions uh, because we know that we're not being true to ourselves. And I think you wrote, um, and we're going to jump ahead here slightly, uh, but you mentioned later that psychological research has demonstrated that this inauthenticity, this pretending to be someone else leads to this feeling of stress and brokenness and anxiety. Yes. And I think, and it's also all caught up with narcissism, because if you think about it, narcissism is all about um, gazing at your own reflection. And if your own reflection um, you don't like, then you want to try to create a reflection that you do like. And that's very, very stressful. And I think you see a lot of this in the millennial generation, that there's just deep anxiety um, about so many different things that I think is caused by exactly what you're talking about and what Lewis is getting at here in this letter through screw tape. And I can, I can personally relate to this is, is a young adult, um, soon approaching his thirties, but not in there yet. I always grew up in the family as the, the goofy grandchild. And I enjoyed that and full of energy, always kind of cracking jokes and stuff. And, and that, that's somewhat my natural impulse. And it's amazing as time goes on and as you get older, the world slowly teaches you, whether it's through social media, uh, other forms of media, that as you get older, you're supposed to be stoic as a man. And you're not supposed to have these, these ups and these downs. And it's amazing how then you start to feel a little bit of rejection of who you are and your authenticity and you start to suppress those. But what's interesting is this is screw tape doing this because here's what he writes about this. He's trying to substitute impulses and desires. And he says the deepest likings and impulsives, impulses of any man are the raw material, the starting point with which the enemy has furnished him to get him away from those is therefore always a point gained. And I think to that, like, my natural impulse sometimes is just to be goofy. And it's very easy for me to slowly get away from that one year after another year after another year. And it's a point gained. Yeah, I think I think you are exactly right about that. And I think he does such a brilliant job of talking about this and the letter. And it, it reminds me there's that beautiful quote from St. Irenaeus, which is, Gloria Dei as vivens homo, which is the glory of God as man fully alive. That God desires mm. to see us wholly his, because when we're wholly his, we are more like he made us to be. And there's that great image in Tolkien's poem, Mythopoeia, or Mythopoeia, or however you prefer to pronounce it, where he talks about God as being like this beam of light, and it hits a refracting spectrum, and then it splinters into all of these different spots all across the colors of the spectrum. And that each one of those spots is fully, uh, it is a reflection of who God is and God's image. And that all those spots being truly who they are makes the whole spectrum of all of the colors. And it's the same analogy that you see in Paul talking about the body of Christ. And you can't say you don't need the foot or the hand can't say it doesn't need another part of the body. But it also reminds me so much of how important it is to cultivate those pleasures that are part of God's design for you. So Matt, you may need to cultivate goofiness some more, but uh, <laughs> My cousins might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but 
there's that great movie, uh, which uh, probably a lot of your listeners are too young to remember, Chariots of Fire, um, with Eric Little, the great Olympic runner back in the 1920s, who's also a missionary. And his family is pressuring him, sort of in the same way that you were just talking about, to be stoic, to be adult. Um, he's such a great runner, but really, shouldn't he give that up to go spread the gospel in China? And there's this really powerful scene in the movie where his sister um, is talking to him and he says to her, I'm going to go to China. And she's so excited because she thinks that means he's leaving running. And he says, but no, I'm going to run in the Olympics first. And he said, and the reason for that is that when God made me, God made me fast. And when I run, I can feel his pleasure. And I think that's exactly when we have that kind of alignment of who we've been made to be and the way that we invest our time, um, something beautiful happens. And we use our gifts. And Eric Little did get gold medals in the Olympics and then went on and spent the rest of his life as a missionary in China. And kind of the, the opposite of that, going back to a different movie, is uh, – I'm a big Mr. Bean fan, uh, but if you watch the Mr. Bean movie uh, about his uh, vacation in France, there's a scene in there where he's trying to be sophisticated, and he's gone to this famous French restaurant, and he can't really speak French, but he doesn't want to admit it, so he's pretending he knows what's going on. And so he's in this famous French restaurant, and the waiter comes up and asks him if he wants the seafood tower. Well, the waiter says it in French. Mr. Bean has no idea what he's talking about. So Mr. Bean is like, oh, yes. So he brings it, and it's like all of this raw shellfish that he just <laughs> thinks is disgusting. And so, but he's too embarrassed to say he doesn't like it, so he pulls the napkin up and puts the oysters by his mouth and pretends to slurp them down while he's actually funneling them through a napkin into a lady's purse <laughs> at the next table. And so then the waiter asks, oh, how are the oysters? And Mr. Bean is like, Mwah, delicious. And so he brings a whole nother thing of them. <laughs> but that's pretty much like what this is talking about, that we're, we're detached from what we really love and we're trying to pretend we like these other things because people will think we're sophisticated or fashionable or cool or whatever. And it's just ridiculous. Wow. And that fits perfectly with the quote of the week. And I'll, I'll restate here so we can, we can talk about it a little bit, but you should always try to make the patient abandon the people or food or books he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food, the important books. I have known a human defended from strong temptations to social ambition by a still stronger taste for tripe and onions. It's pretty much exactly what you were describing there. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is such a great image. And the reason I think it resonates so much is we all experience that temptation to pretend to be who we're not, to pretend to be more sophisticated than we really are rather than to just enjoy who God has made us to be. And Lewis was very, very aware of this. There was a big movement in England uh, in the period when Lewis is writing these letters and before that too, really starting in the 20s, but going through World War II, of this group of people called the Bright Young Things um, that Evelyn Waugh is the novelist that really chronicles their exploits. But it's all of these people who are mostly uh, wealthy aristocrats who are just doing all of these stupid things, um, trying to be cool, you know, uh, plunging into the fountains in the center of London in the winter, or um, raiding through different stores and doing crazy things in public just to be noticed because then people will think that they're cool. And this Lewis is the opposite of this talking about somebody with a strong taste for tripe and onions, you know, and that it's great because that, that and reinforces the idea of somebody who's very comfortable in his or her own skin, the way God has made them to be. The word, the phrase I should say, because it's two words that I once heard in college and now always remind myself mimetic desire. 
And if I remember this correctly, it's like a desire based on the world, not like your own inner. And so I used to always think this, uh, I went to Notre Dame and there, their big finance Wall Street place. And all of the kids wanted to be investment bankers. It was the most prestigious job. And I remember thinking to myself, I didn't do banking because I'm like, that just sounds miserable just because everyone else thinks it's prestigious. It's a hundred hour work week, brutal, building pitch books and PowerPoint presentation formatting. What part of that at all calls me to it? But everyone wanted it because it was the cool thing. It was the toughest jobs to get. Right. Yeah. And it, it becomes like the emperor's new clothes. You know, it is everybody's talking about it and everybody's talking about how awesome it is. Uh So what's wrong with me? If I don't think it's awesome, I need to change myself. And this is, you know, it's exactly the opposite of Romans 12, one and two, where St. Paul is talking about the fact that we need to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And then the whole idea of do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's mm. that's where the rubber really hits the road, that we don't need to let the world mold us. We need to be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that we can then approve what is good and acceptable and perfect. Oh, that is that is a beautiful usage of that. And I have lots of thoughts on that. But let's turn to the damage control because this is a profound last paragraph as well. And I want to make sure we have enough space to talk about this. So listeners... We've the the patient is in a very good spot right now, and Screw Tape is not happy with Wormwood. We've seen why experience the true pleasure. Well, as we know, and constantly comes up with this, they aren't out of tools yet, and in fact, they always have other things in their toolkit. And so, let me read. This will be a slightly longer paragraph, but it's just so good. The great thing is to prevent his doing anything. As long as he does not convert in, it into action, it does not matter how much he thinks about this new repentance. Let the little brute wallow in it. Let him, if he has any bent that way, write a book about it. That is often an excellent way of sterilizing the seeds which the enemy plants in a human soul. Let him do anything but act. No amount of piety in his imagination and affections will harm us if we can keep it out of his will. As one of the humans has said, active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The more often he feels without acting, the less he will be able ever to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. Oh, what do you think about that one, Father Brian? I think that is one of the most important passages in this whole book. And it's something that in this feelings dominated age in which we live, there is so much wisdom in this. And part of the thing that is so astounding is we're so self deluded. You know, for example, and if you think about ministry to the poor, you can think about in your head, oh, I feel such solidarity with those people who are suffering. I feel such solidarity with those people that have lost their jobs during the pandemic. I feel so bad for those people who are homeless. Well, you can feel all you want, but if you don't do anything with that, it accomplishes exactly nothing. It (laughs) changes nothing. And I think screw tape with Satan just wants us to live there, and I'm, I mean, I'm preaching to myself about this because this, mm-hmm. I, I understand this from experience. And this whole idea of habits is so very important. And, you know, I had taught screw tape a number of times, and I felt so stupid because it wasn't until the last time I taught it last year that I finally saw that there's this subtext about habits that runs through the whole book. And I think habits were on my mind because I just read Justin Early's terrific book, The Common Rule, uh, which is all about habits and how important habits are uh, in in following Christ. And so uh, you see this passage here where I think Lewis just nails it um, through Screwtape's words that uh, we are so prone to just wallow. We're prone to just be absorbed in our feelings, not ever do anything. 
And there's this great uh, little known theologian who's out of favor called Joseph Butler, um, who was from this period of theologians that Lewis loved, Richard Baxter, in the same period where Lewis stole Mere Christianity, the title um, from Richard Baxter's work. But Joseph Butler, uh, who was the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, um, said this, he said, practical habits are formed and strengthened by repeated acts and passive impressions grow weaker by being repeated upon us. It must follow that active habits may be gradually forming and strengthening by a course of acting upon such motives and excitements. And basically what he's saying is that the more that we put into practice what we believe and actually do things that strengthens it and strengthens it and strengthens it. While on the other hand, the more that we just think about doing it, but fail to ever act, we get to the point that we will never act. Oh, I have so many thoughts with this, but I feel like that was a beautiful way to leave that part there because that is just the habits and feelings has been a big part of what I have gotten from screw tape letter. So that was very well said. We have a section and I'm going to be curious if you have any thoughts with this that we'd like to do at the end called unscrewing screw tape, or it might be screw tape unscrewed. <laughs> I might be getting that wrong. Um, or we just try to pull out a couple like do's or don'ts. If any come to your mind from this passage of good principles that we can take from this in our own spiritual journeys. And I can kick off with one that's very straightforward to give a sense here, but when you feel like you are in a slow fade or in a down place, do genuinely repent and turn towards God. Open yourself up to receive that grace, that cloud of witness. I think that's right off the bat. It was just such a beautiful thing that the patient did and allowed himself to. Yeah, um, I would I would wholeheartedly concur with that one that you just stated, because I think that's the key to the whole thing. But I think another one that is particularly key for the times in which we find ourselves right now in this pandemic is to embrace true pleasures and to proactively seek after truth and goodness and beauty. I'm very fortunate in living in what most people consider to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And yes. Charleston, yeah, regularly is at the top of the Condé Nast traveler list of best places to go. But um, one of the blessings of this pandemic has been to just be outside more and to look around and to look at the beauty, to look at the gardens, to look at the architecture, to look at the harbor and the ocean and all of that. And I think the more that we do that, and these don't have to be costly sorts of things. You know, it's just like in the letter. It's a walk outside in a beautiful place. It's reading a terrific book just because you want mm -hmm. to and drinking a cup of great tea. It's like that Lewis quotation that I always get backwards. But he basically says, I can never find a cup of tea big enough or a book long enough to suit me. And that shows Lewis uh, embracing his true pleasures. Oh, that's so good. And I'll throw one more do in and honestly, I don't have any don't. So the, uh, the do that came to my mind here uh, was do act. When you feel act, the don't let time, it's almost like there's a, a popular business book, the five second rule. The second you feel like doing something, count to five and within that act, when you're waking up in the morning and you're laying in bed, do I get out of bed? Do I not? One, two, three, four, like just do it. Um, I do that with actually working out and weightlifting and stuff, but make the same thing with your spiritual life. If you feel this longing, this pull towards repentance, do something. You know, whether it's get on your knees and, and repent to our Heavenly Father or you feel this desire, this pull going to maybe you haven't been reading scripture as much, open your Bible. It doesn't have to be go read the Bible in a year. It can be read a single chapter or a single verse and just ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into what he's uh, what's being spoken to you in that moment. But just whatever that feeling is, associate some action. And again, it doesn't have to be life-changing action. It's just something. And it's amazing how actions build on each other. Yeah, I think that's a great one. That 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 whole acting part of taking the feeling and not just basking in it, but converting it into action, I think is 
just a key to experiencing the joy and vitality that we want in our spiritual lives. Well, Father Brian, thanks so much for co-hosting with me today. And so before we get to the sign-off stuff, can you tell the listeners where they can learn more about you, listen? Uh, I know you've done some podcasting, got some courses and stuff. Can you just share a bit more information about that? Sure. Um, The easiest place is to just go to Apple Podcasts and search under my name. Uh, There's a Mere Christianity podcast that we're doing right now. Uh, there's a Screw Tape podcast. There's a, an Inklings podcast series. Uh, there's a Life of C.S. Lewis podcast series. Uh, these are also all on our church website, St. Philip's Church, Charleston, uh, which if you Google, that will easily come up. So delighted to have anybody check out any of that. Uh, and those things are some of them available on our YouTube channel as well for St. Philip Charleston. Wow. That is fantastic. I actually, I've, I've listened to some, but then I came across how many you have. So listeners definitely go check it out because when I was trying to find the after hours interview, because now that we've had, I don't know, a couple hundred episodes since we started, I was like, okay, I got to find this. So I actually just searched your name in Apple podcast, hoping our episode would pop up in all of your stuff. And I'm like, man, there's a lot here. This is incredible. <laughs> And needless to say, yours on ours never popped up. So I had to scroll through and find the uh, season three, episode 35 (laughs) podcast. (laughs) But listeners, in this letter, we learned how dangerous real pleasures are to screw tape. And one such pleasure in my life has been the Slack community. It's just been absolutely incredible, and it's open to all our Patreon supporters at the silver level and above. So if you want to be a part of that and and experience that beauty, definitely go check that out. Um, You can go to Pints with Jack's Patreon channel. And we want to say thank you to our top-tier supporters, Jeff, Chris, John, Kate, and Rowdy. And to all of our listeners, uh, thank you for joining us, and please join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.